Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Thomas. Um, I'm based in Paris. I've been working at Google Define for the last uh, maybe six years. Um, thanks. I want to first like thanks the organizers for the invite. I'm pretty pleased to be here. Uh, and the summer school sounds pretty amazing. Um, thanks you all for being here. And also thanks Nora for sharing some of the slides and the content that I will be sharing today. So a big topic, I guess. Uh, quite, quite a bit of responsibility of talking large language models. Um, so I have one hour. And instead of basically going into a very you know, detail of something very specific about the training of large language models or something really you know, night picking, uh, I decided to rather do, try to do something that I would have liked to have when I started working on LLMs, which is basically a good overview of how things work in, in a sense of how do you start from a, you know, um, an untrained model and how do you actually land into something that you can actually use and works as you, as you expect. Um, we know that there is you know, training, of to uh, training on tokens and all this, but like, what are the choices that you have to make? What are the different calls you can make depending on your needs, on your application, your compute, your data, all this? Um, and also, there will be a later section for this, but um, what are the current trends or like, um, things happening in the field that you should be aware of when making those calls? So, very short introduction, then the training loop, which is separated into pre-training, post-training, and finally safety, which is really key in actually developing those models. And the what else section is rather what I mentioned in terms of like, you know, what else you should take into account when making those calls um, and trying to build the best model for your needs, because once again, uh, you have limited compute and you have to make the good calls for your needs to be able to have the best performing agents in your situation. So, um, when ChatGPT came out, uh, I think like, you know, I will be saying something pretty, pretty boring, but when ChatGPT came out, this was, this was like really um, a key moment for me at, at, at least. Uh, I was working with Theofan Weber that will be actually be giving talks tomorrow um, on, reinforcement, on, on reinforcement learning and credit assignment, which I still strongly believe is a very exciting topic. But, you know, um, today's the focus is rather on LLMs. And Chad GPT kind of like made me realize that the thing that I wanted to build, which is a general intelligence, was actually kind of already at reach. Uh, if you had enough compute, enough data, you could train a model that was actually better than what I thought was possible. So that's why I decided to switch to it. And to me, LLMs with with incredible capabilities, cheap to fine tune, unlimited application, and I'm sure um, you have seen this lately, crazy startups. So people are raising, you know, like crazy amount of money uh, for basically applying LLMs to the real world. And when I started working on deep learning, uh, 2012, 13, I was right at a peak where like deep learning blew up. Um, and, and honestly, right now, it feels exactly the same as kind of a second wave, but with LLMs. So you are in a very cold spot in terms of time and you know, locations for actually being able to catch that wave in a sense. I know um, this is kind of going against what uh, Jan Lequin or such are actually saying, that you shouldn't work on LLMs. I, I still, I, I kind of disagree. I know what he's saying this, but I kind of disagree in a sense of like, there's still things, very useful things to learn um, in knowing how an LLM works, no, learning how to train those models because it's a different paradigm than what we were doing before on very smaller model, uh, RL environments and such. So this might, be, this might not be it for doing you know, very general intelligence and get to AGI, sure. But there are still very valuable lessons to learn by actually investigating those methods. But as you are probably aware, they are also very costly in terms of development. So data and compute is really at the core of pre-training. We'll see that right after. Um, and, and this is where 
you have to be clever to be able to leverage this technology without to have to do everything yourself, because otherwise it's really, really expensive. So let's dive into how do we actually build something? How do we build an LLM uh, from scratch to basically something usable? The, the training is divided in two parts. The first part is called pre-training, and basically the the goal of this, of, of this part of training is really simple and kind of a bit boring to me in a sense of like, that's where I'm working on, by the way. But it's, it's a bit boring in a sense of the goal of this phase is only to train on millions and billions of tokens, uh, the model to try to predict the next token. I'm giving you one token, you try to predict the next one. With two, you try to predict the next one and so on. And that's the only logic, the only you know, objective that you have in this phase. The thing though is like you're doing this on billions or sometimes trillions of tokens. And what this gives rise to is actually a model that is capable of learning languages, learning some kind of logic, knowledge, and all this. And this is kind of crazy to me how such a simple objective can actually give rise to you know, such behaviors. Because when I was doing reinforcement learning to get clever behaviors, you have to do crazy stuff. You have to be very clever about variants, about biases, about, you know, and this is really hard to get right. In this, I'm not saying it's, you know, plug and play, but it's a single objective doing all this for you. And it's already out of the box, giving you good results just by doing this pre-training pre phase. But if you just do that, at the end of the day, the model is, is not, it's kind of a raw talent. It doesn't know how to interact with you. It doesn't have any goal except basically pre uh, predicting the next token. So you have what we call the post-training phase. And this phase is basically about fine-tuning this model to your specific goals, to your specific needs. And so for example, um, Let's talk about, you know, uh, ChatGPT, Gemini, or whatever. Like, you want something in this case that is interactive and answer questions and, you know, basically answer your needs. And for this, you will just just have to do post training about, you know, conversational agents. But on the other side, on the other end, you can have, you know, models that are doing something very, very different. You can have something that is just about summarizing tasks, and that's it. You just fine tune on this task. So you take the same pre-trained model, which is kind of this raw, very generalist and powerful model, and you fine tuning it to your specific needs. The cool part of that, the second phase, is that it's pretty cheap. You need, you know, on the order of 10,000, 100,000 maybe max uh, examples to get this right. And the compute is pretty cheap as well, comparatively, again, comparatively to the pre-training phase. And so what is, what I believe is cool because I'm working on open weight models, so basically models that we are giving to the world to play with, uh, is that we are doing the pre-training phase, which is really expensive and you know, data and compute is, is really hard. But at the same time, people can leverage those models down the line to their needs, to their startups, to their applications, and they only require, honestly, you know, it's pretty cheap to fine tune. So, Enough about the general uh, introduction. Let's just dive into basically what are the choices you have to make when actually doing the pre-training pre phase. So I mentioned uh, what you have to do is get a bunch of data, um, get some compute, and try to predict next token. And that's pretty much it. But then you have a bunch of choices to make. It's not just like, so, okay. In this case, for architecture, what are you trying to achieve? And what can you afford and pick accordingly? So what I mean by this is most of the model today are actually using transformers. So in a way or another, you have a bunch of transformers stuck together. And this is your general architecture in terms of model. Um, but to serve, this can be a bit expensive. So what new methods, for example, that came out pretty recently last year, uh, our recurrent models, recurrent models are really old, but state-based models are pretty new. And those models are pretty interesting at the moment because they offer um, 
they are slightly worse in terms of performances, but they are much cheaper to serve. So in terms of inference, when you're trying to, training the model is a bit complicated, sure, okay. But when you have the model serving it, so basically making requests to it and getting answers is much cheaper than with transformers. So depending on how, you know, can you afford more complicated and harder training for cheaper, uh, for cheaper um, sorry, serving or not? And those kind of choices, uh, those kind of like, restriction can actually influence your choice. Then there is a question of like, depending on your application, uh, wild versus deep. So you can do deeper, wider, and those things should be tested in your application with your metrics to basically get the best out of your model and your compute. And attention patterns. You can play with context window. So, you know, if you're playing on stuff that you know the input will not be very long, you can have a context window pretty short. And in this case, you are actually making, uh, you know, uh, training faster. You are making, in a nutshell, your life better. But at the same time, if you want to do summarization of very, very long text, you will really need long context. And in this case, you have to be a bit more clever about how you train things to, to be fast. Basically, here, what I advise when training a model is to do ablations very early on on those kind of questions to basically set up the architecture according to your metrics. Then we have a key element, which is data, of course. Um, this is a lesson that I uh, heard, I mean, learned the hard way when I started working at LLMs, which is you can be as clever as you want in terms of like, you know, finding the right hypers, uh, being clever with the architecture that I just mentioned. If your data is bad, you will get nothing out of this. So getting good and high quality data is, is hard, uh, but what, you know, my, what is mind blowing to me is like the open source community is crazy fast and they are crazy clever. So you have online open data sets that are already really, really strong for pre-training. Uh, even if you're not working in one of the big tech companies, you can build very strong models and this is, I think, an exciting time for the open source community because um, we need large amount of data. And in DeepMind, for example, we are, I don't know, like, you know, 2003, I, I don't know how many researchers we are, but like, we are a small group still compared to the world. Uh, the open source community are potentially millions of people. And in this case, you know, um, you can have access to data that might actually be harder to get for us as being part of big tech companies. So there are opportunities on the data side that you have access to as being part of the open source community that I think is really exciting today. In particular, if you have some specific needs about, I don't know, medical applications or such, there are open source data sets that are really cool for this. So once you have gathered all your different data from different sources, um, you need to make a mixture of this. And when I started working on LLMs, I was like, okay, um, this is actually coming from a very thorough, um, you know, deep research on how to find best your, your mixture. It's not. It's basically people just trying a bunch of um, mixtures together and trying to find the one that gives best performances. Um, so you have to run ablations on different mixtures very early on as well, with while being a bit clever. And what I mean by this is you have to select the size of your model accordingly to your compute. But the size of your model implies a certain quantity of data. And a certain quantity of data means some data sets might be very small in your training, in your data sets. Um, and therefore, in this case, you have to be clever, not, for example, to repeat too much this data during your training, during those X amount of steps, steps, because otherwise the model will just overfit and basically just do a citation of the data sets. So you have to find a good mixture that on the one hand give you good results, but at the same time, just, just don't copy part of your data set by just seeing it like 10 times. So this is kind of a tricky things to do, but at the same time, this is really key in getting good results at the end. Uh, by the way, I didn't mention, but like if you have questions, uh, sure we'll have like I say, I mean 15 minutes at the end, but 
If there is a pressing one, uh, please ask. It's like, um, it's open. Then scaling laws. Those models can be huge, as you know, but we can't afford actually, you know, finding and doing sweeps over hypers on, 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 big, on big models. So what we do is we actually use uh, sweeps on smaller models and then interpolate the best hypers at these smaller sizes to be projected to the bigger sizes. And this is actually surprisingly uh, effective in basically knowing what are the best learning rate and such at high scale, knowing the performances at very small scale. So you basically just do regressions, if you will, um, of the best hypers on very small models, and then you can actually, I mean, uh, interpolate the ones that you will actually be interested in during training. And maybe you will have to do one, two, three guesses at this uh, bigger size, but you have a very good guess of what is a good one. And this can save you, uh, you know, um, a bunch of either money, time, or, you know, or both. Distillation. Uh, this is something that is pretty key to me. Um, so during Gemma, Gemma is the models that we're developing. During Gemma 1, we didn't use distillation. I will explain what is distillation. Um, but for V2, we used it, and we, I was kind of like really excited to see how powerful distillation is. So well, as I mentioned yet, I mean, just earlier, uh, pre-training is just about next token prediction. So I'm just trying to predict next token given what I have now, uh, and so on. What distillation is doing is actually doing inference on this data on a bigger model, saving the logits, so basically the prediction of this bigger model, I'm saving this, and I will use those logits as target for my smaller model. It's pretty simple, but this gives you a much richer uh, signal to learn from um, an objective. And this allows basically to squeeze much more knowledge into a given size of model, and this will give you also better results for a given amount of time and compute. The thing though is that you have to do inference, and this is, you know, depending on the size of the big size that you are using, this can actually be, you know, pretty expensive. So either you leverage someone else doing this for you, so open source community might have done that and actually do have those logits for you, so you can leverage those, or you can do it by, you know, you already have gains when, by just actually doing this on, on, on pretty small, um, bigger models than yours, but not much. And the gains are pretty crazy in terms of like what you get with distillation and without, without changing much of the pipeline. And then there is the whole question of uh, evaluations of this pre-training that I completely like, you know, hide, hide it to you. Um, when I first joined, I was like, okay, evaluation, boring. But it's a very complicated question. Um, so we are using different type of evaluation. The first one is academical benchmarks. This is like, for example, the table that we had in GMA2. Um, oh, so yeah, actually, that's, that's pretty cool. It's, you can actually see here the difference in performances. Those are different benchmarks. And you can see the differences in performances. Higher is better. And you can see the differences between GMA1 and GMA2, for example. Uh, there is not just about distillation, but part of this is due to distillation. And you can see that the performances are really strong. And so the academical benchmarks are like kind of, this is part of them, but this is like all the weird names that you're seeing on the left. And these are basically testing different types of capacities of your model. So knowledge, uh, reasoning, math capacities, uh, you know, um, general Q&A, those kind of things. And depending on your needs, again, like it's really need specific, you can handpick a couple of them and those will be your evaluation and the thing you will actually looking at. As we are trying to build generalist agents, so something that is really general that everyone can actually leverage and use for their use cases, we are trying to get something pretty, you know, uh, good across, across the board. But if you have something in mind very specific, don't do that. This is much, you know, more it's much more expensive to train a generalist agent than something specific. 
Um, and you will be able to be, be much better, of course, like let's say at coding, if you just train on coding rather than actually also teaching it about how to speak, I don't know, like uh, French, for example. Uh, I will mention after, but there is issues with academical benchmarks. But another one that we use is perplexity. Perplexity is pretty simple to understand is what is the probability of the actual next token in the data set? So I'm taking part of the data set and I'm trying to predict, uh, I'm trying to see what the model is predicting the actual next token is. And so I'm looking at the logit of this next token and I'm basically seeing how good the model is at predicting the actual right next token. And this is a good sense of how much the model is actually general across different type of data sets and different type of capacities. Um, and perplexity is actually much more stable uh, than, than those classical benchmarks, which can be pretty noisy. Perplexity is much more stable. And so for training, um, in particular for very, I mean, for debugging or such, this is very useful. And then I will go into um, what we call evaluation crisis. So um, those benchmarks are obviously open source, um, and which is really cool. But at the same time, you know, we are training on basically the whole internet. And the whole internet is, you know, there's a lot of knowledge, but there is also sadly a lot of time those academical benchmarks that can be leaked into those data. So you can try to remove them in one way or another, but there will always be evaluation leakage. And so it's kind of like if you mix your test set and your, and your train set in a classical uh, manner of speak um, together and you, you, you kind of like don't say it. Like sure, you will get good numbers. You will saturate them, saturate them actually very quickly, but like it's not for good reasons. So um, that's, you know, that's why basically there is kind of a continuous race of developing new benchmarks, um, I mean, by the open source community to make sure that like some of them are not leaked yet into the data sets. But as soon as, you know, it will be put online, then people will actually put them in a training data and so on. So it's really, you know, those, those numbers that you see uh, on, online and, and reported by, by papers always have to be taken with a grain of salt because as you know, um, um, it's a very trendy topic. Uh, there is many, you know, money at the end of the day uh, to be made by, you know, creating your own startup of, of something by just claiming base numbers. But of course, if you put the training set, the test set in the training set, then you sure you can you can actually saturate, saturate those numbers very quickly. So the best thing down the line is actually playing with the model yourself and actually saying if the behaviors are actually the one that you're looking for. Um, the last thing that I will mention that, is, uh, that arises, uh, arised uh, last year, I guess, is what we call open OLLM um, benchmarks. Uh, LMCs, I don't know if some of you have heard about, is basically a platform that is capable of loading many models that are available today, uh, coming from the very small ones to the very big ones. And you can prompt the model, you ask it a question, and the, the website will actually give you two different answers coming from two models that have been randomly selected by the website itself. So you don't know which one is actually giving you the answers. And it asks you to basically rate which one is your favorites. Uh, are they basically the same? Or there is one that is much worse. With that, on a huge amount of people, uh, capacities and all this, this actually is a very good signal uh, for, you know, for, for actual quality of interaction with models. Couple of problem with this still, because there is no perfect evaluation. The people doing the prompts and answering them are actually a very small fraction of the populations. In a sense, it's like us, researchers, are people kind of like in the tech world making those questions and having uh, being aware of those websites. It's not like uh, someone that is not in this field asking about, I don't know, a specialist about cooking or a specialist. I'm sure the questions that are being asked are well too much biased towards like, you know, computer science, math, and those kind of things. So it's a nice signal to get, but it's also biased by the people that are actually voting in it and asking questions in it. Another thing that is problematic with it is 
you have to be careful because once again, information can be leaked. So this website, for example, actually relists uh, some of the data that they acquired, and therefore you can actually fine tune your model on this data itself. It's not leakage uh, because you know it's a different data set, but it's your modifying your model to be better at this specific task, which is fine, but it's just less of a, you know, agnostic test than before, which, again, it's good and bad, um, but it's something to have in mind when you actually are looking at those numbers. And in particular today, there is a strong race at these ARENA scores that you can see on the top right. I'm sorry, the blue is not very visible, but basically it's a list of models and they are ranking different models by those matching system. Um, and there is a strong race at this. Um, I think down the line, uh, again, for your needs, I'm, I'm going to sound like a you know, very old man just repeating again the same thing, but for your needs, the best thing down the line is actually to play it, with it, uh, play with it yourself. Because again, the question are pretty general, yours might not be it's just about coding, then you know, why asking about math, I mean, you know, about like history question or whatever. Okay, so post-training, sorry, <coughs> training was a bit long, but post-training will be shorter. So now I have this very, you know, um, generalist and powerful model, but it's a completely raw power in a sense of like, it has not been fine-tuned to perform any specific task. So you have to do that and you have also to let it know what are good and bad behaviors because the model at the moment has just been trained on the whole internet. So it's, you know, it's pretty vague and various in terms of like the, the behavior that you can see. So in post-training, there's two phases, um, instruction fine-tuning and RLHF. So instruction fine-tuning is still supervised learning uh, that just teach the model to do, you know, following instructions. So it's, a, again, a data set, not coming from just like, you know, next token prediction as, I mean, it's next token prediction, but on a data set that is just about question answers and basically making sure that the model is following um, the prompts that we are giving it. So uh, in this case, we have basically very strong data with question and answers from experts, let's say, um, that teaches the model how to behave when facing this kind of question, when facing these kind of things. Um, it's also helping the model, uh, yeah, it can be uh, specific to various domain and applications, um, and it's much cheaper than the pre-training phase because here, as I mentioned, it's like on the order of like 10,000, maybe 100,000 example are enough for this phase. Um, it's crazy how much the model actually is changing in terms of behaviors by just this small phase. And the model is then, at that point, really usable uh, to perform, uh, you know, kind of a chatbot. It's already good enough. The second part is RLHF, so reinforced learning from human feedback. This is something that is really close to my heart because this is, I mean, mixing RL, which I love, and this is where I actually started working on LLMs by doing RLHF. Uh, Daniele will actually uh, talk to, to this about this like tomorrow. Uh, so here, there's a kind of paradigm shift. So far, we just have done um, supervised learning. Now, from now on, we will be doing reinforcement learning. Um, so, how many of you knows about RL? Sorry, I'm, I'm really, uh, please raise your hand if, if you, you know a bit. Okay. Okay. So, um, instead of just giving perfectly the right answer by just, for example, the next token, I'm giving you the perfect next token and I'm, you just like try to predict it. So, this is kind of the target. Your target is like already defined. If you are here, you are letting the model give you an answer, and you have what we call a reward model that is capable of rating the quality of your answer. This is tough because you want your reward model to be really powerful because otherwise you will just, you know, give a random signal to your model. But this is also um, really powerful because it's less expensive for humans to give a one hot feedback, kind of, than actually giving you the answers. Um, again, I can just tell you, is this answer good? Is this answer bad? Rather than having to type myself the answer. 
And there is another power of, of this method of LHF, which is instruction fine tuning that I just mentioned earlier are just about trying to predict the answer that was given by, the, by, by me on the data set. But the problem is that there are many possible answers for a given question that are still valid. And so this is tough for the first way that I mentioned, instruction fine tuning, to grasp. Because the model will just try to predict the answer that you gave it. While if the reward model is good, it will be able to give the same type of rewards for different type of answers that are all good, all strong enough, all answering the questions. And so this learns basically diversity and not overfitting to one kind of behaviors and basically what we call um, Model, model collapse in a sense of like just collapsing on the exact answer that was given by, by the data set. Um, it also um, teaches the model uh, knowledge limits because so far, um, I mean, I'm sure you've played with, with model online. Um, the model is often pushing you to the, it's really convincing at everything and sometimes it's really good uh, the answers are surprisingly good on some technical, technical domains. But at the same time, and sometimes it's really good at giving you answers that are completely wrong. But they are, you know, if you don't know the domain, you trust them because they're really good at like, you know, pretending. And this is where RLHF can come into play. Because the model has just tried to predict next token and therefore, you know, why saying, I don't know. There is no incentive to this. I will just try to predict the next token and the next and the next and the next. If you ask me a question, I will just try to, I will just take the max probability, let's say, of the next token for the whole sentence. And here you go, you have your answer. Why should I say, I don't know? This is terrible. This is actually really hard to say. But for this, the reward model, again, this is relying on the fact that the reward model is good. But the reward model is capable of distinguishing the, you know, the, the, the good and the bad answers. And therefore, the model will able to generate by himself the answer, I don't know. I don't know is a good answer. If I prefer you to say, I don't know, if the reward model is capable of capturing this, the reward model should be able to say, I prefer you to say nothing and say, I don't know, than actually saying something that is wrong and bullshit. And this is really relying on the reward model. But if the reward model is good, this is really powerful to make your model basically hallucinate a bit less. And to wrap up with the training um, part, uh, evaluation on post-training are slightly different. So there's still academical benchmark that I just mentioned earlier. There are potentially diverse sets. Uh, there is pre-training evaluations you can use on post-training, but there are also different uh, post-training specific evaluation. But the most interesting one, I guess, are human preferences. So what we just mentioned with RLHF, which is, OK, now I will just give you two answers. And is this model preferring my model versus the previous one? And this is actually surprisingly powerful and cheap to compute. Only by, I don't know, hundreds or you know, thousands of, of ratings, you can actually have, have a very good sense of what model is best. And this can actually drive very nicely research. You can also do. Uh, model preference, this is something that is really close to my heart. So what I mentioned earlier with RLHF, I'm doing some self-promo at the moment. Uh, when, with RLHF, you need human feedback. So you need at some point to um, do a prompt, have an answer, and have a human saying, okay, this one is bad, this one is good. The things you could do, which is a bit meta, but is actually ask another LLM to write the answer of your first LLM. The rating part is much simpler. If I'm asking you, do you like this answer, yes, no, it's much simpler than I'm asking you, please give me the answer. So for a given size, a model is much better at discrimination than generation. And so you can use the discrimination as a teaching signal for the generation. So what happens is, that's, called, that's what we call RLAIF, so AI feedback. And so what you do in this case is you do reinforcement learning, you do your questions, you get your answer from the model, you ask another model, okay, from one to 10, let's say, please rate the quality of this answer. I'm getting a signal, and then I do reinforcement learning on the first model to 
from this signal. And from here, there was no human involved, which is pretty crazy. And we have shown that this actually improved the performances of the model without any human in the loop. And so this is kind of like self-improvement of the model. And to me, this is where like things are starting to be really sexy in the sense of like the less human there is in the loop, the better it is. But you can also just, instead of plugging these answers into the learning algorithm, you can just take it as a learning signal and just knowing, okay, the, model, the, the, the LLMs are saying this model is better than this one or better than this one. And of course, you need to have at some point some self-evaluation to make sure that the LLM is not saying, you know, bullshit. But um, very often this signal is very powerful and very good. So you can do basically evaluation for pretty cheap of your model just using the same LLM that you have trained, but on the classification mode. So you just ask it, you prompt it. It's the same model, but you prompt it and you say, okay, how good is this model compared to this one? And that's it. And this is really powerful. And the last one is the open model that I just, uh, the open LLM leaderboard that I just mentioned earlier, which is, you know, fighting against each other on, on an arena and basically letting the humans uh, tell us what, is, what, what model they prefer. I will dive into safety, but are there any questions on the pre-training or post-training parts? Yeah, please. Are you already feeding the model for new training with past generated uh, answers coming from the model and put online? Um, sorry, generation from, I, I, I missed your question, sorry. Okay, so you basically you scan the, the internet? Yeah. Okay, and you collect? Yeah, it. a bunch of data. But uh, it's well possible that part of the data yeah. is already produced by by LLMs. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. And so, yes, that's very true, and this is one issue in the sense of like, um, how do you know that you're not like basically just copying the answer of another model? Because I guess that the tendency in the future is that the automatic generated content will be much, much, much more than the human. Tool. Yes, and this is a very tough question. So at the moment, we're lucky enough that like, it's not too much of a case. And in particular, when we were doing like, you know, things like one year or two years ago, then you know, we were pretty safe on this side. But the more we go, the more, and myself, uh, you know, like, um, if you get a long email by me, it's most probably actually coming from a model. Um, it's, it will be complicated. So either you, if your goal is to train a small model, um, and those generations are really good and passes your quality test, kind of, for selecting the data, then who cares, in a sense, you know? Um, with the subtlety that, like, we are by, we are by building those models, kind of enforcing a way of talking or enforcing a way of speaking or enforcing some kind of behaviors that we want those models to have. We being researchers, but kind of who are we to decide those things? It's really tough in terms of ethics, in terms of like if we are then floating the internet with this kind of data that will then be actually used as training data as well, there is kind of a weird, you know, um, uh, snowball effect. Um, so this is a, you know, tough question. But if the quality of your data is good enough, then you know, it's fine. Yeah. No, this is okay. Just is it possible that the models that we see on the leaderboard in 10 years will basically converge to the same? Because they will be yeah. eating their own. Yes. It's a very good point. And yes, it's possible that, I mean, it's possible. That would be one of the things that people will have to fight, fight against when developing those models is not collapsing to the same kind of um, to the same kind of behaviors, but the cool thing is like those open uh, metrics are actually really cool because they they never stop evolving, and so I would agree with you if the metric was fixed 
And therefore, um, I think I have a plot somewhere um, where, for example, this is on MMLU. This is one of the classical benchmark for like math knowledge, let's say. Um, and you can see that like all models are kind of converging to the same points, and it's kind of like the maximum that we can get to. Um, in what you just mentioned, yes, it's possible that we converge to the same thing if the evaluation was fixed. But as we will be evolving in terms of evaluation, my hope is that you know um, it will always be a race towards like a new target that will be harder and harder to reach. But I, your point is very valuable and will be very tough for the data teams um, to, to work on in the future. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Yeah, there is another, another question right here. Um, is there any way, uh, any research into the model learning more from higher quality data than low quality? Or is it only through data curation that, uh, because with the current approach of predicting the next token, yeah. if you feed it bad data, yeah. the model doesn't know it. And is there any research into the model itself deciding yeah. what to learn from and uh, what not? Yeah, not so um, when I studied, I thought like only good quality data was best. You know, you want the best quality data ever. The fun part is like, uh, and I'm one of the worst for this, is when typing on Gemini, on ChatGPT or whatever, um, I'm tapping like, I'm tapping terrible. And there is, you know, wrong spelling everywhere and I don't care. And this is because the model has already been trained on also crappy data. So at the beginning of training, you are fine actually having the model having some pretty, you know, noisy no data where like, you know, signal is not perfect because this also teaches the model that all this is fine. All this is, not everyone speaks perfectly every day all the time, and the model has to capture basically this kind of behavior. So it has to be able to generalize from a bad spelling, uh, you know, one word is out of, it doesn't make any sense in that sentence, but I should, I should still move on, and that kind of thing. So um, diverse and low and high quality data at the beginning of training is important. Later on, on the training data, you want to have your models a bit, you know, more, you want your data to be a bit higher quality because you want, at the end of the training, the model is not just about understanding, but reproducing what you have done, what you are giving it to it. And so you want to make sure that the data is high quality for the model generation to be high quality as well. Um, in terms of like, maybe your question was leaning more towards like, I don't know, active learning or trying to understand, you know, what, what should I give it to it? Uh, there is research. Uh, on this topic at scale, and at least on Gemma, we are not like pushing this at the moment. Um, I would say the, the main thing is uh, by the data ablation that we're doing, we are try, trying to understand, you know, what the model seems to need the most by, but it's not like um, active learning as you are picturing it in a classical manner. It's more like, you know, handcrafted active learning. So you kind of change the mixtures, see the performances and kind of iterate like this. So it's kind of old style, I mean, very old style active learning, uh, if you will. Yeah. Um, with Gemma, you settled for RLHF. Yeah. Did you also explore a direct preference optimization? Yeah, so um, it's, it's a good question. Um, the, we are, um, and in particular, I think this is, to me, this is the most sexy part of, of um, this is not yet plugged in into the final model. But um, this is one of the, the exciting bits in a sense of like the, the signal that you're getting from humans is much cheaper, as I mentioned, just getting, you know, one out encoding rather than actually scale or something. Um, and and the, the, the reward model in this case are much better. Um, we, uh, Daniel will actually mention this, I'm sure, tomorrow on the RLHF side of things. Um, we have developed really cool, I think, um, okay, um, this is like, again, I'm biased, uh, but really cool new algorithm for uh, preference, model, uh, preference uh, learning on, re on reinforcement learning. Um, and I think this is still an underexplored domain, for sure. Um, so we are moving, we are looking into this for Gemma, um, and we are actually actively working on this, but uh, this is still a growing field and pretty early on, for sure. So thanks so much for the question. So um, going to safety, um, basically there is the question of like, how do you do safe models when doing open versus closed LLMs? So closed models are pretty lucky 
because you have access to them through an API. And the cool thing of having an API is that you can actually just you know, have classifiers that take the input that you're giving it to it, look at it, say, OK, this is unsafe questions. I just don't answer. And the same for the answers. I'm looking at the answer before actually sending it to the user, and the answer is not safe. I just don't answer, I, I don't answer it. I answer something very plain and boring. But the problem is, like for the open weights, things are a bit more complicated. And so they need to be safer by design. Because when people have their models on their laptop, we have no control in terms of like how do they play with it. And we know that they will actually make, make the worst use of it. We have to assume that they will make the worst use of it in the sense of like trying to tackle it to be really painful in terms of like safety and, and trying to make it say the worst thing ever. So how do we do this? Um, first, uh, maybe related to your question, uh, the, the pre-training, um, the, 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 we filter pre-training data. We want pre-training data to be safe because again, as you know, uh, the more you train on you know, unsafe data, the more the model is capable of actually answering that kind of things or actually reproducing that kind of things. And then we do safety tuning. So we use reinforcement learning and in the reward model, we actually incorporate some safety metrics in a sense of like, we want the, the, the reward model to capture is an answer safe, racist, or whatever, into um, the reward models for actually teaching the model what is right and what is wrong. But this happened pretty, so there is two phases, like rather on the data, but also on the RLHF side of things, and also in description fine tuning, but by selecting the data, but also by changing the behaviors of the model by correcting it. So the, the model says something bad, we correct it. But at first, we also change the data to make sure that we lower the probability of the model saying something bad from the ground up. And then this is how do we make sure through development that the model is safe. But at the end of the day, we also need to make sure that like we have done a good job. So there is the academic, they are the academical benchmark that I mentioned. And there are two different things, the human uh, side by side. So very similar to what I mentioned is like giving you two answers, which one is safer than the other one. And then there is like, we have, uh, we are looking at like internally um, for Gemma, we are looking also at internal safety evaluation. So for very specific and, you know, uh, detailed type of uh, risk, uh, we have a bunch of data on our side where we test this model on the, on very bad prompts or very tricky prompts to make sure that the model, even on the very, on, on very tricky situations, is capable of realizing what is happening and saying, I don't want to answer to this. And not, even if it's really subtle, because people are crazy. I'm, I'm, I'm on Twitter and I, I, it's crazy how people are clever, how to you know, try to act those models in saying something bad. And so we are trying to catch up by actually building data that is you know, even more clever in trying to trick our own model to make sure that the models are actually safe. OK, last phase. Uh, 12 minutes, should be fine. Um, in this phase, OK, so far what we've done, uh, we know that we should do pre-training, instruction fine-tuning, RLHF, what each of those phases actually brings to the table. Uh, and so now we have kind of the recipe for training the model. Cool. But now we have a bunch of choices to make for developing our own model. So again, open versus close, those are kind of like two time, um, the different models that came out uh, you know, across, across the last years. There is only a bunch, a, a, a small fraction of them. But what is really cool and what seems to happen more and more is that there are more and more open models coming out every day. And what is fascinating to me is how fast the open community is capable of actually taking the model we are open sourcing and actually making a new application or fine tuning it for their own needs. For example, for GMA2, uh, we open source GMA2, I think, on a Wednesday or Thursday. The next, I mean, the, the, sun, the next Sunday, like four days after, uh, a Chinese group actually fine tuned GMA on Chinese and was really, really, really strong on Chinese. It was four days after. Like, it's, to me, it's absurd. And like, it's the, the and it was not even like a big tech company with a lot of compute. It was like, you know, a small, 
Uh, it was on Twitter, the guy just like said, okay, yeah, yeah, it's a very good model, sharing it with the world. And here you go, the model that was not tuned to be really good at Chinese was now very good at Chinese. And this is kind of crazy how fast things are happening once you have the pre-trained model. So for, for me, again, very strong bias because I'm working on Gemma, but um, releasing those models is really important because this allows people to have access to, those to these very powerful me you know, methods. Sure, um, we are giving models that are between the range at the moment between 2 and 27B, um, 2 27 billion parameters, uh, which is already pretty big, to be honest. Uh, but, for example, Meta released a 400M, uh, 400B model very recently. And so this is a beast. This is enormous. So just to say that, like, you can have access today to models that are really, really, really strong. And the, the pace at which the open source community is, is moving means that, like, the model that you have today is basically the best that we had six months ago, even internally or something. So it's pretty crazy what everyone can have on their laptop, running on their laptop. And again, we are, I don't know, 2,000, 3,000, I don't know, no idea, researchers at DeepMind. But there are millions of developers in the world with crazy ideas, crazy quality ideas, application, and they are much cleverer than, than, than we are. So why not just giving them those models and trying to see what they've developed with to basically down the line, maybe inject some of those new things into our models. So it's kind of a win-win relationship where we do the pre-training and they can leverage those models to develop new methods, RLHF methods, or developing new ideas of post-training, or, you know, I don't know, new application of fine tunability. And as I mentioned just earlier, you can see on MMLU, so this is only one metric, but just to give you a sense, how in green is are the open weights, in red are the closed weight mod models. How those two you know, type of communities are actually converging to the same point. So early on, there was a strong gap between what was accessible in big tech companies and what was accessible outside by the open source community. But nowadays, those models are actually very powerful and can sometimes even beat closed source models. So it's really crazy what people can have access to nowadays. Then you can ask yourself, and it's related to it, how big of the model do you need? Because, uh, of course, the smaller, the better for you, because cheaper, faster, um, you know, less data and all this. But at the same time, you have requirements in terms of capacities or what you want your model to be capable of. And so you need to make a call of how big is the model. Um, my take is that we can do, uh, this is like debatable and unbiased, um, but my take is that we can do very much with very little. So on the top right are the results of GMA2 2B. 2B is really small. Um, on the Elena uh, Arena that I mentioned earlier, you know this leaderboard where you match two models. Um, and the higher the better, basically. And you can see that the 2B model that we released is actually better than this one. I don't know if you can see it properly, but this one is ChatGPT 3.5. So that was a model that is much bigger. And that was kind of like the best model we had for a long time before GPT-4 came out. And it's completely beating it, crushing it. And this is something, the, the first one that I mentioned, is something that you can run on your laptop or even on your phone, offline without any access to internet. So it's completely mind-blowing what you can do with this. So you might. If you have specific needs, go to higher models. Uh, we go to 9B, 27B, or even higher. But for most of our needs, I believe that we can go very small. And it's really powerful. And this is a, 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 um, a, a plot that I like quite a bit. I found it on the internet. I should have actually uh, said where. Sorry about that. But what you can see here is this is our 27B model, uh, GMA2. And on the on the left axis is the Arena ELO score. Again, higher, better, and all this. And on the X axis, it's the numbers of billions of parameters. So here, for you, it's rather the smaller, the better. And what is the, 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 the section that is really exciting is rather the one where Gemma is, which is you want small models that perform really, really strongly. 
Sure, you can have very big models that perform amazingly well, but no one can actually run those on, on their laptops on daily life. So what, what kind of the point? I mean, it's good for research, it's good for moving to the best model and best capacities, but for usability, this is not the best. And so what you can see here is basically our 27B is performing better than uh, the LAMA 370B model. So it's beating a three times bigger model than, than yeah, it's beating a three time model, um, which is pretty well. And this is kind of where the open source community and the open waste community is going to. Like, we were going to bigger and bigger and bigger models, and now there is kind of this trend of actually going smaller and trying to get more juice from a small model. And yes, I even have a small video that works. It's basically a, a, a Gemma 2B, but it could be any open weight model that has been uh, quantized. I would just mention after what is quantization, and that runs on a phone uh, really fast. So you have basically a ChatGPT 3.5 plus, because it's better, on your phone without any access to internet. And you can do this today. Like, I mean, you can do this six months ago. This is crazy. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a bit crazy as well, but like, I'm, I'm just saying this in a sense that like, to me, the, the, I, I'm developing this model and the speed at which it, it goes, it's, it's, it's crazy. You are living in an amazing time and you know, dive into this, it's, it's really crazy. Uh, and quantization last is basically, you can actually reduce um, the numbers of, of uh, the, the quality of your weights, uh, the definition of your weights, so float 64, float 62, uh, 32, sorry. You can go to, I don't know, in four, um, so to so four bits, sorry. Uh, and you can, you lose a bit of performances, but very, very little, but you diminish the size of your model by a lot. And so it's pretty crazy also, there is a strong research on this side of quantization. So even for a fixed model, let's say a 27B, you can take the 27B and actually make it much smaller by not changing anything, by just changing the weights and making it, in, I mean, uh, yeah, four bits, eight bits or whatever. Um, then the question is how long training should last? How many tokens do you need? Because you have picked a size depending on your needs and your capacities in terms of training, but like now, how long is training? So this was in 2019, we were using, uh, for BERT, there was 128 billion um, tokens, then there was JDPT, 300 billions, and then there was Chinchilla, that was kind of a new model that kind of said, uh, we are under training the models. We need to train for longer with more data and this will push performances higher. And they were training on 1.4 trillion token in this case for a model that is much smaller than the bigger ones. Uh, I haven't mentioned, but the bigger the model is, the bigger you should train, and the longer you should train with more token you should train. So you can see that like basically a model that is like much smaller than Megatron, for example, is actually trained with more tokens than, than it. And it allows to get much better performances from a forgiven size. But we have pushed this, so they have developed a theory about like the ideal, perform, the ideal ratio between training time and uh, performances. But what we realize today is that we should go higher. It's a pain, but we, higher is still better. So for example, for a 2B model, which is 35 times smaller than Chanchilla, we have trained it on two trillion tokens. Uh, so yes, two trillion tokens. And it's still getting some juice. We are still getting some juice by pushing those, those, those things uh, ourselves. But of course, two trillion tokens, you know, it's, it's hard to get, of course. So that's why I think the open source is cool because you are, we are doing this job and giving you the models that is out of this. And you can use it out of today. So yeah, they have came out, what I mentioned with Shanshila, they have came out um, how to, what is the trade-off between training and, and between the size of the model and how long you should train it. Um, and we call this X, one X is basically what this paper is, is like, um, you know, uh, proposing. And for Gemma 2, as I mentioned, we train it 50 X. So we train it 50 times what was, we, I mean, recommended by this paper. And we were able, thanks to this, to get even better results. The gains are smaller and smaller, of course, the higher you go, but they're still going to be, you know, if you want to extract the most juice as possible, there is. 
two last things is generalist versus specialist. So if you want to build a very general model and you don't know what you want to build, of course, do something general or have a mixture that is really general. But the issue with this is that you will not be able to be best at your use case. If you know what you want to do, just reduce your data set to exactly what you want to do, and of course, get more in a smaller model. This is pretty obvious, but this is something that we have today very general models, but I think we should rather, if people have very specific needs, instead of doing this, start from scratch and have something that is really specific to their, models, to their needs, and they will be able to go much, much, much smaller. And the last slide is uh, something that I think is pretty scary, um, is what I call race to the bottom, is how expensive it is to feed an LLM uh, and get outputs. So it's uh, per dollar, uh, it's dollar per tokens. So in 2022, uh, it was worth around 0 0.06 uh, dollars for 1,000 tokens. Um, and nowadays with Gemini uh, Flash and ChatGPT uh, 4.0 Mini, uh, it's around $0.05 dollars per a million token and 0 0.15 per million tokens. So it's becoming incredibly cheap, cheap to actually use those model. Something that was like only two years ago was impossible to imagine to train, now we can. Like we have now a million or two million context lens. You can put like 10 books as an input and the model will be able to actually look at all of this. Like two years ago, we were like at something like 4K or 8K was already good. Like the speed again at which I'm kind of like an old man you have understood now. Um, the, the speed at which it develops is mind blowing. I think I'm done. Uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate. Thank you.